When we see loved ones there, those who have gone before, eternal joys to share. And oh, what a song, when the blood washed throne starts singing a song, the angels cannot sing. Oh, what a moment when we see Jesus, when we stand face to face in His embrace and thank Him for us. Good, Josh. Thank you for that. Take your Bible and go back, if you will, and look at Genesis chapter 45, verses 4 and 5. Again, the Bible says here, And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother. Now watch what it says here. I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore, be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. I want to speak to you tonight on it's all about family. It's all about family. Over in the book of Genesis, chapter 50 and verse 20, we read these words, where the Bible says, and this is, of course, later after chapter 45, of course, but something that is very similar to what's taking place in this particular room with Joseph and his brothers. This is the end, if you will please, uh, of Joseph's coming to the uh, parting, if you will, the end of his life. And the Bible says here in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, the Bible says, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to uh, bring to pass to, it says, it, as it is this day to save much people alive. Now, God had a plan for Joseph's life that I think Joseph did not completely understand until he's living it. Sometimes you don't see the end. All you can do is walk in the presence. Sometimes it's hard for you to predict the way you'll be five years from now, two years from now, or even yet a year from now, or six months, or a month from now. But we do know this, that God wants all of us as children of God to be obedient to the Scriptures and to please him in every avenue of life. And I want us to see how God had brought this family to a point and place in their life where God is going to do a marvelous work in their individual lives. One day a little boy was talking to his daddy and said, Daddy, uh, where was I born? And daddy looked at the little boy and said, Well, son, you were born uh, in Kentucky. He said, Oh. He said, Daddy, where was Mama born? Oh, he said, Son, Mama was born in Indiana. Well, Daddy, where was you born? Oh, he says, I was born in Georgia. 
He says, well, where was little sis born? He said, little sis was born in Alabama. That little boy sat back, got this big old grin on his face, and he said, Daddy, isn't it good that God saw fit to put us all together? I'm going to tell you something about Parkside Baptist Church. Isn't it good that God saw fit to put us all together? We have an amazing church. I don't know if you know what's going on here. Uh, but we have an amazing church. We have a good spirit in our church. We have people that love God in our church. We have people that God has brought here from every corner of the country. Let, let me show you something. Uh, uh, Brother Craig, do, do if, if you would, get one of those mics. If, uh, let's do this section at a time. Section at a time, okay? Uh, if, if you are not born uh, in Texas, but you're a member of this church, you're, you weren't born in Texas, but you're a member of this church in this section all the way front and back, would you stand? Uh, you're, you're a member of this church, but you were not born in Texas. All right, go around, Brother Craig. Tell us what city, state, and if a different country, what country you were born in. Just do it real quick. Go. Union City, Tennessee. Okay. Hartford City, Indiana. Huntington, Indiana. Uniondale, Indiana. Uniondale, Indiana. Speak up just a little bit more, if you will. My dad was on an Air Force base in Sasebo, Japan. Wow. wow. Okay. Go ahead and sit down if you already said. All right, Vaughn. Wallace, Louisiana. Saginaw, Michigan. Brattleboro, Vermont. Knoxville, Tennessee. San Luis Potosí, Mexico. Frankfurt, Germany. That was from Alaska, that one. <laughs> Go ahead. Oak, Indiana. Clark Air Force Base, Philippines. Wow, that's good. How about this section here? Not, not born in Texas. Switch mics, if you will, Brother Craig. I'll come up to the front. Okay. Well, do, go ahead and switch it out anyway, if you will. And don't touch the bottom. And you got that mic. You know which one it is. Uh, let's start up here like we did. Start in the front here, if you don't mind. Start in the front. Go, Brother Craig. Come on, Brother Craig. There you go. All right, go. Uniondale, Indiana. Lakers, Nigeria. Wichita, Kansas. Fort Wayne, Indiana. Munster, Indiana. Decatur, Indiana. Eglin Air Force Base, Pensacola, Florida. Lakers, Nigeria. Hey, now, now, if you're a girl, don't, you know, don't, don't, we can hear you slow down. Go ahead. California. Peoria, Illinois. Bartow, Florida. Okay, good. This section right here, not born in Texas, but members of Parkside Baptist Church, would just stand, please. All right, here we go. Shreveport, Louisiana. Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Uniondale, Indiana. Huntington, Indiana. Fort Wayne, Indiana. Fort Wayne, Indiana. Fort Wayne, Indiana. <laughs> Larry, Ohio. High Point, North Carolina. Hattiesburg, Mississippi. <laughs> Newark, New Jersey. Gilbert, Arizona. Philippines. Gilbert, Arizona. Mesa, Arizona. Meeker, Colorado. Manila, Philippines. Long Branch, New Jersey. Cortez, Colorado. Right back there, you got one. Union City, Tennessee. All right, this section right here. Not born Texas, but you're members of this church. Stand, if you will. Uh, you know, this is fun, isn't it? Go ahead. Fort Wayne, Indiana. Memphis, Tennessee. Uniondale, Indiana. Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> Franklinton, Louisiana. New Hope, Arkansas. Des Moines, Iowa. Cassie Grand, Arizona. 
Mexico. Mexico. Ansbach, Germany. Bluffton, Indiana. Coahuila, Mexico. San Luis Potosí, Mexico. El Salvador. Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Mexico City, Mexico. Good. All right, right up here, if you will. Go ahead and stand if you're not born Texan, but uh, you're members of the church here. Waconia, Minnesota. I was born in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Tacoma, Washington. Bogalusa, Louisiana. Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I hate to claim it, but Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> Phoenix, Arizona. Whoops. Martin, Tennessee. Indiana. Winchester, Kansas. Arkansas, Kansas. Lawton, Oklahoma. <laughs> Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. Belfont, Pennsylvania. From India. <laughs> Manila, Philippines! <laughs> okay, Brother Craig, go upstairs. Go upstairs, if you will. Go upstairs. Go, Brother Craig. Go, 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 go. There you go. All right, good. Uh, you're a member of the church here in the balcony, but, uh, but uh, uh, not born here in Texas. Would you stand, please, and uh, tell where you're from. Nice and loud where they can hear you, because we're all the way down here. You're all the way up there. Go ahead. Dyersburg, Tennessee. Okay. Lagos, Nigeria. Lagos, Nigeria. Lagos, Nigeria. Lagos, Nigeria. Kenai, Alaska. Eaton Rapids, Michigan. Brother Craig, you're doing a good job. Arlington Heights, Illinois. Poughkeepsie, New York. All right, that's good. Give Brother Craig a big hand. That's good. <laughs> Isn't it neat how God, I was born in Baltimore City, Maryland. Where are you born? Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas. Yeah. Where? Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas. Yeah. Where? Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Hattiesburg, Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> But isn't it something that in our church family, we have people from all over the United States, and as you saw, not, not just a few little countries, but several countries that's here tonight that are members of our church. And God has brought different people from all walks of life to be able to be members of Parkside Baptist Church. But yet, we understand this, that we are in a family together. And I want to speak to you tonight on it's all about family. It's all about family. I want you to take your Bible, go if you will, over to uh, Genesis chapter 45, Genesis chapter 45, and just kind of rest there for a little bit. Here in Genesis chapter 45, you'll see that now it's been uh, 23 years since Joseph has seen his brothers. So it's been 23 years since he saw them and was able to speak with them whatsoever. God was preparing Joseph to be able to to provide not only for his own brothers, but also for his dad, also for his mom, also, if you will please, for those that were traveling in with that particular family and all those that lived in the region. Benjamin Franklin said this, doing an injury to those that are your enemy puts you at a great disadvantage. But if you avenge yourself, it puts you even. However, if you forgive them, it puts you above them. And here we see that that is exactly what is taking place in Joseph's life. Can I tell you, as we are all different walks of life that sit in this uh, sanctuary tonight, in this auditorium, uh, we have one thing in common, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen. We have the Word of God also in common. Stay with me. 
we have the commands of God that God has given us in common, and God expects us to be obedient to those things. Now, let me, let me speak to you tonight about some things that Joseph learned and what was revealed through Joseph and his uh, relationship with these brothers and with his family and with others that could help us in being a church family that is so very diverse from all walks of life. Statement number one, I want you to notice the revelation that confronted them. The revelation that confronted them. Now you see here that Joseph uh, knew who his brothers were immediately, but they did not know who he was. Uh, you understand uh, that they would have not known him even if uh, he would have said, uh, I am Joseph, except for the fact that he would reveal himself as being the one that was Joseph. So we understand this. Uh, the Bible says over in John chapter 1 and verse 10, the Bible says, like it unto the Lord. Uh, he was in this world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Here you see that was a, a very private revelation that was shared. Watch this, if you will. Genesis chapter 45 and in verse 1, the Bible says that uh, Joseph could not refrain himself before all them uh, that stood by him, and he cried and caused every man to go out from, he said, uh, caused every man to go out from me, and there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And so this was very private. And by the way, when you get saved, it's very private. Uh, Joseph uh, sent uh, the Egyptian slaves out. He sent the servants out. He sent the soldiers out of the palace area where he was meeting with his brothers, and it was a very private meeting. Now, can I tell you that uh, you and I can build private relationships inside of a church family? You know, not everybody in the church you're going to like. There's going to be people inside the church you don't want to sit beside. There's going to be people inside the church that, hey, you don't really care if you ever get to know them or not. Now, thank God, uh, God's blessing the church and their church is growing larger where you can choose various types of friends and stuff like that. But sometimes having somebody that rubs you the wrong way is good for you because that sandpaper takes off all the edges that are not supposed to be there. All right? So we see this, that it was a very private revelation. Then we see, look at Genesis chapter 45 and in verse 2, you see this. The Bible says, and he wept aloud. It says, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh. So here he is, he wept aloud. And, and those that were Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh did what? They heard. It was so loud that they heard him weeping. So he was very passionate about this. Don't forget, he hadn't seen his brother now for 23 years. For 23 years, they were separated out. For 23 years, uh, things could have built. That hatred could have built if you had hatred. Uh, that jealousy could have built if he had jealousy. That division could have built if he had division. But you notice this. Uh, you see no revenge in his heart towards his brother. You see that there was uh, no resentment in his heart towards his brother. You see that there was no retaliation in his heart towards his brother. But you see, even though they did a great wrong towards him, all he wanted to do was love them. That's all he wanted to do. Kind of reminds you of the Lord, doesn't it? The Lord on the cross, and all he wanted to do is say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So what was he doing? Uh, he was simply displaying that a Christian ought to behave wisely even when they're hurt. Now you say, why, am I, why, am I, why are you saying this, preacher? Because in a church like this, where you have so many diverse cultures that are attending the church, if you're not careful, you're going to get hurt feelings. Because somebody's going to view it differently than what you viewed it just by nature of the fact that they're, diff, they're uh, from a different country or they're from a different uh, uh, state and uh, they were raised differently. All right? So I'm saying this. He had, he had passion, if you will, in giving this revelation. It was a very passionate revelation. You see this, that uh, uh, one man, if you will, uh, growing up, uh, he had a son. And I, I love the story. He had a son, but the son became the black sheep. I mean, uh, he was always doing things wrong. He was disgracing his dad all the time. His dad would give him a, a second, a third, a fourth, and a fifth chance uh, to be able to make things right. But the boy just kept edging and doing things wrong. One day, uh, this daddy was out, and he was uh, with a friend. And the friend said, well, let me tell you, if that was my son, he said, I would beat him within an inch of his life. I'd give him a tongue lashing that he would never forget. I'd kick him out of the house, and I would never let him come back into my presence again. The father looked at the man that said that with tears coming down his eyes. He said, if it was your son, 
maybe that's what you would do. But let me remind you, it's not your son. It's my son. And I cannot do that because I love my son. Now, wait a minute. That is the type of love you're supposed to have for people. You are supposed to love people. Your, your love should not be conditioned upon what they do or how they treat you. Your love ought to be unconditional love, and you love them for who they are, not necessarily for what they do. So here you see that it was a very private time of revealing this. This was a very passionate time of revealing this. This was a very plain time of revealing this. Look at it. Genesis chapter 45 and in verse 3, the Bible says, And Joseph said unto his brother, he said, I am Joseph. Uh, doth my father yet live? And his brethren uh, could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. Now, wait a minute. And so that's all he had to say, by the way. All he had to say is, I'm Joseph. He was revealing himself. By the way, uh, baptism doesn't save a person. Being good doesn't save a person. Uh, going to church doesn't save a person. All you need is Jesus Christ. And when he reveals himself onto mankind, mankind ought to be able to open up and say, that is all I need. By the way, when he revealed himself onto these men, they were standing back and they were astonished. Don't forget, there was Saul. He was marching down the Damascus Road, and uh, he was the one that was condemning the church, uh, condemning Christianity, treating it like it was uh, a cancer, treating it like it was a cult. And the Bible says that walking down that Damascus Road, that he was kicked and against the pricks, and all of a sudden, uh, uh, the Lord is the one uh, that spoke onto him, if you would, and he said, I am Jesus, all right, that you kick against me, in other words, you're kicking against my church, and he took it very personal when somebody was taking on the local church. There was a plain revelation. There's a powerful revelation. Think about this. Look at Genesis chapter 45 and verse 8. The Bible says, so now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. He have made me, listen to it, it says, made me a father to Pharaoh. Uh, so it was God that lifted him up out of the house. The Bible says, and the Lord over all his uh, house, the Bible says, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. So here he is, and he is revealing his power. By the way, he's not coming to them as a slave. He's coming to them in sovereignty. He's not coming to them as a criminal. He's coming to them as a king. He's not coming to them as a lad that they once knew. He's coming to them as a lord over that which is the providence of Pharaoh. You understand tonight that uh, he was showing, uh, he had the power to, by the way, he had the power to crush them. He had the power to destroy them. He had the power to put them in their place and to send them back home or have them executed, but he didn't do that. See, the more power you have to destroy people, the more you ought to forgive somebody. You say, I tell you what, I don't like so-and-so. I wish I could get even with them. Then a wrong attitude, sir, sorry. Wrong attitude, ma'am, sorry. What you ought to do, if you have the power to crush somebody, you ought to give them more grace. Give them more forgiveness. By the way, that's what the Lord did for you. That's what the Lord did for me. So there's the revelation, if you would please, that uh, uh, he had and he confronted them. Then you'll see this. You'll see there's the realization uh, that convicted them. Look at Genesis chapter 45 and verse 3. The Bible says, and Joseph said uh, unto his brother, he said, uh, I am Joseph. Uh, doth my father yet live? And he, that's it says here, and, and the brethren, it said, could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. Now here Joseph is, and Joseph was just standing there, and just the sheer identity of who he was brought conviction. Just the sheer identity of who he was. Don't forget, they're not, they're not talking to a slave, they're talking to a master now that could put them in slavery. They're not talking to just a brother, they're talking to one that is like an unto King Pharaoh, he himself. They're not talking to somebody that is powerless. They're talking to somebody that has great power. You know, they were convicted simply because of their, uh, of their iniquity as they stood before that which was the king of the land. Genesis chapter 42 and in verse 21, the Bible says, And uh, they said one to another, uh, We are very guilty concerning our brother. They said, We're very guilty. Now, wait a minute, watch this. When somebody sins against you, if they have a Holy Ghost, you realize they feel guilty? There's people in this room tonight that has hurt another church member sitting in these pews tonight. 
that has come to my office and bawled their eyes out because they hurt another church member and said, I, I, I just feel so bad. I feel so guilty. I feel so rotten because I hurt somebody else. Now, by the way, that is good. That is not bad. Because we ought to feel bad when we hurt somebody else. If you care about somebody, you ought to weep tears when you hurt somebody else. If you care about somebody, you ought to uh, be desirous to be able to make that relationship right and to make that relationship what it should be. Do you realize that Joseph could have had them ground up for dog meat? Do you realize that Joseph is in a state, in a position whereby he could have took a machete and stood there and chopped their heads off every single one of them. But he did not do that. What did he do? Uh, He realized that these were standing guilty before him. The Bible says, in that we saw the anguish of his soul. They realized that Joseph was not there just because of the way that he presented himself. Can you imagine this? And here Joseph is, as he reveals himself, he's not saying, let me show you who I am and I'm going to get even with you. He is saying, hey, I'm your brother Joseph and the tears are swelling up and uh, the hurt and the pain and all he wanted to do was to be able to help them and to serve them. Hey, can I submit to you something tonight? When somebody hurts you, why don't you decide to be the good Christian? Number one, forgive them. Number two, try to forget it and bury it somewhere, but then go back and serve them. Go back and serve them. If somebody steps on your toes and somebody makes you mad, why don't you go and serve them and love them and help them and do good to them and try to uh, uh, get them to a point, to a position where they can rise up and serve Jesus Christ again. Isn't that what our Lord did? The Bible says, and when he besought us, it says, uh, we would not hear. Therefore, it says, uh, to this distress, it says, uh, come upon us. He besought us. uh, He said, please don't throw me in the pit. Please don't do this to me. Please don't hurt me. Please don't forsake me. Please don't leave me here. And they mocked him, and they went away. And as far as they was concerned, he could have died. But he had a right spirit all the way through, didn't he? What is it in your family? Are you bitter towards your husband, your wife, your parents? What is it that somebody has done in your family? What is it somebody's done in the church family that's hurt you so deep that you want to get even? That you want to make sure that vengeance is yours, saith the Lord. Where you become God in charge and now judge. What is it? Somebody says, well, I've been so hurt. Can't you be Christian enough to forgive? By the way, you listen tonight. Do you understand that there's not a perfect Christian that sits in this room? And when you think that you have arrived, can I tell you, you're a far cry from it. Well, I joined Parkside Baptist Church and I thought it would be perfect. Welcome to the real world. This is not a perfect people. This is not a, you you say, well, uh, they're a Christian. They shouldn't act that way. Well, you're a Christian too, and you shouldn't think that way. What about forgiving people before they wrong you so that when they do wrong you, it's not even a hiccup in your life? Could you not be that good of a Christian? Could you not be somebody that says, I'm going to forgive them in advance, and that way if they ever do wrong me, it's okay. Because I've already forgiven them for anything they could ever do. You think that would help some marriages? You think that would help some child-rearing endeavors? What if you teenagers said, I realize that dad's not perfect, mom's not perfect, so whatever they do, I give them grace in advance. So no matter what they do, I'm going to forgive them anyway. You say, well, it's not, it shouldn't be that way. I mean, after all, I should make sure that dad and mom are judged. Maybe so, but you're not the judge. You let God be judge. You let God be jury. Don't take on your parents and say, come on. And we come from so many different backgrounds. You know, I was not raised in a Christian home. My daddy drank. 
My daddy come home sometimes on a Friday and, and would be drunk. But I didn't hold that against my daddy. You asked me about my daddy, and I said, boy, I had one of the best dads in all the world. He clothed us, he fed us, he taught us how to work, he taught us how to take on responsibility, he taught us how to be men. Boy, I thank God for dear dad. Now, can I tell you, listen, uh, you got parents, your parents are not perfect. So what do you do? By the way, you got a pastor. Can I tell you something about your pastor? I looked at him in the mirror right before preaching, and I found something out. He's not perfect. Man, I found out that he is very, very much imperfect. But yet some of us, even if the Lord Jesus Christ would be preaching tonight, we still wouldn't give him a chance. I'm saying this tonight. Uh, there was that revelation that confronted them as he reveals himself in a private matter. And by the way, that's what you're supposed to do according to Matthew chapter 18. If somebody offends you, you're supposed to go to that person and that person alone. You're not supposed to bring your brigade with you. You're not supposed to bring your army with you. Well, you know, I think I need to bring my mama. I think I need to bring my daddy. And you're in your 20s? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Help us now. Hey, it's time to grow up. Yeah. If somebody offends you or somebody hurts you, the Bible uh, uh, antidote for that is you go to that person and that person alone. Yeah. And you say, listen, uh, you have done something that is hurt. And by the way, keep it off the Facebook. Now, I'm going to love you just a little bit, a little bit straightforward, but some of you are too immature to have Facebook. Because what you're doing is every time you get on there and somebody says something bad about you, you have to rise up and you have to, uh, you have to defend yourself. And you're always defending yourself. You're spending more time defending yourself than you are reading the Bible. And because of that, it's getting you in trouble. You're saying things. You know, it would be good for some of our adults to uh, take a, a diet and fast from some social media things because it is ruining your spirit. I've always said this, never correct somebody in text. You say, why do you say that? Because I've learned the hard way. I've learned the hard way correcting somebody in text and they read it not the way you wrote it and before you know it, they get mad at you. So if somebody's having a problem or something that I need to correct, I say, come by my office and see me. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean everybody that comes by my office and sees me is in trouble. Go down to the pastor's office. I wonder who's in trouble tonight. I want to look outside the door. That doesn't necessarily mean that. But I'm saying this, you be careful. Don't, don't do things that are not wise to ruin relationships. We got good people in this church. I'm telling you, we have good people in this church. We have people in this church that love God. We have people in this church that have good intentions. We have people in this church that uh, they're, they're not trying to hurt anybody. But now listen to me. If you're not careful, you can hurt somebody else because your mouth becomes the size of a whale. You have to be very, very careful. So there's the revelation. He confronted these men, if you will, that had hurt him, and he confronted them personally. Then they were convicted. Now watch this. You'll see this, and I love this part, and I'm going to bring it to a close. I've only got three points here, and I'm so sorry. But there was that which was the reconciliation that comforted them. So wait a minute. First, you see this. First, you see he confronted them privately. Second, you see because of that, they were convicted. Thirdly, you see because of that, he comforted them. He did not hold them over hell so that their tiptoes could be down in the fire. He didn't do that. The whole reason was to bring them back to a place where they could be blessed, where they could be helped. This is the climax of the story. Uh, really, this is the climax of Joseph's life. It runs parallel with 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18 and 19, where the Bible says, in all things, it says, are of God, who have reconciled, it says, us to himself by Jesus Christ and have given us the ministry of reconciliation. You have one ministry that God has given you 
that is named as a ministry that God gave you through Jesus Christ. What is that? That is the ministry of reconciliation. Don't go to bed mad at each other as husband and wife. Don't go out of the house mad at your parents. Make sure that your relationships are right and make sure that God uses you to be able to bring those that know not Christ to the Savior where they too can hear the wonderful story of the gospel and receive Jesus Christ as Savior. You have a ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, the Bible says, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. And it says, not imputing their trespasses onto them. Now get that, Christian. Not imputing their trespasses onto them hath, uh, have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. In other words, it wasn't always, you know, uh, uh, I, uh, uh, you didn't cook good last night, and, and, and you'll probably never cook good, and, and I wish you could cook like your mama, and, uh, and boy, you just bother me the way that you cook. And then the very next night, she tries harder, and she tries to come up with a new recipe, and you walk in, and you don't even give her a chance, and you say, did you cook again? I mean, last night, it was a disaster. You know, tonight, it's going to be a disaster. You know, I, I, it, okay, I'll taste it, but you're going into it negative. Hey, listen, why don't you give her a chance? Why don't you back up and say, Hey, I know it's going to be good. I know you gave it your best shot. Hey, are you listening to me? Uh, don't always be negative around your kids. Yeah. Right. Help your kids. Encourage your kids. Let God be able to use you because of your relationship with others to help your children to see that they too can have a good relationship with others because most of the time they will copy what you are. Okay, watch, 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 watch. You have people in church. They come to church and, I mean, and, and I'm not expecting you always to be excited. I, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not expecting you always to say amen. Because you could say amen at the wrong time. So I'm not. I'm not expecting you to be a Mrs. Heminger. I'm not expecting you, if you will, to be somebody more than what God created you to be. But I think you ought to live up what God created you to be. Amen. I think that you ought to live up to Scripture and say, okay, this is where I will walk therein and stop using excuses, your excuses, why you choose not to walk therein. Amen. There's three miracles that took place right here before the eyes of Joseph. You'll see that the grief was used by God. He was in grief. He saw his brothers and he was moved so emotionally. He hadn't seen him in 23 years. He was moved so emotionally that he had to send everybody else out of the room. So God was going to use his grief. Genesis chapter 45 and in verse 5, the Bible says, now therefore, he says, be not grieved. So even though he was grieving, he is taking his grief instead of saying, I need help. He was taking his grief and saying, I'm going to help you with your grief. He was majoring on their need in comparison to the need that he felt. By the way, you want people to forgive you, you spend the rest of your life forgiving people. Amen. You want people to love you, you spend the rest of your life loving people. You want people to be happy around you, then you spend the rest of your life trying to make other people happy. You see, because what you are, to be honest with you, is what you're going to reproduce. Come on. Now, I think you need to have a balance. Because the Bible says a false balance is an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Have a balance. So you, you can't always be, I'm going to read my Bible, 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 and let your family starve. You've got to have a balance. Well, I'm going to go soul winning. 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 But you have to take care of your husband. You've got to feed the guy.
you got to have a balance. You know, you, you bring proper balances in your life that will help you. The Bible says, now, therefore, it says, be not grieved nor angry. Now, watch what it says, with yourselves. He knew that these guys were good guys and they did something that was wrong. But he was saying, hey, look, I know you're angry with yourself. You know you shouldn't have did it. I know you shouldn't have did it. And I know down inside, you're probably angry with yourself. He said, don't be angry against yourself that you sold me hither. He says, for God did send me before you to preserve life. By the way, preserving life was their life too. Look down in verse 7. The Bible says, and God sent me before you to preserve you. Listen to what it says. It says to save your lives by great deliverance. So he said, uh, God was using you to bring me to a place. You didn't know it. But God was using you to bring me to a place where I could be more greatly used of God. Here's the thought. So the trouble that you're going through right now, God's prepared for you. The trouble that you're going through right now, God himself has prepared for you. Now why? To draw you closer to God himself. Look, if you would, please, if you will, uh, with uh, the guild, if you will, that was met with grace. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 45, and in verse 4, the Bible says in Jesus, uh, or in, in Joseph, and Joseph, like an unto Jesus, by the way, and Joseph said unto his brethren, uh, come near to me. He says, look, I pray you come near. He says, and I, I am Joseph, your, your brother, whom uh, ye sold into Egypt. He said, just come near to me. He wasn't trying to push him away. He wasn't saying, I can't stand to be around you because you hurt me. I can't stand to see you in the hallway because you hurt me. I can't stand to be nice to you because you hurt me. He didn't do that. By the way, nobody, I believe, in the Old Testament is more like the Lord Jesus Christ than Joseph. And his proper responses ought to be studied by you, especially if you had some deep hurt in your life. Somebody said this, you really never have to be afraid to get close to somebody who really loves you. You never really have to be afraid to get close to somebody who really loves you. You know, when somebody loves you, they'll forgive you. When somebody loves you, uh, they're not going to judge you. When somebody loves you, they're not going to become your executor. When somebody loves you, they're not setting themselves up to be your enemy. Joseph didn't say, I'm your executor. He didn't say that. Joseph did not back away and say, look, you hurt me. Hadn't seen you for 23 years. I lost 23 years of my life with dad. I was his favorite son and you took it away. You stripped me of everything. I went to prison. I served in stocks. Isn't it amazing? He never brought anything up. Not one time did he bring anything up. Not one time did he slap back. Not one time. He was saying, I'm just so glad to see you. You know, what you did was wrong and it hurt, but don't be grieved over that. Because I love you. By the way, that's Christianity right there. Amen. I love you. I want to restore you. I want to help you. But the average Christian is this way. You hurt me, therefore, I'm going to hurt you. That is not Christianity. He said, I accept you. I'm not going to dwell on the past. I'm going to let God use it. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to forget about it. I'm going to go forward. That's real Christianity. You say, preacher, that's hard. That's why it's called Christianity and not humanism or humanity. Right, See, you need God in this. Amen. You, you cannot forgive people with the strength that God wants you to forgive people by yourself. Right. When's the last time somebody hurt you real deep, and you got alone with God and said, God, I'm having a hard time 
But I know with your help, it'll be okay. So God, I'm going to rely on you every single step of the way to help me to respond proper. When's the last time you did that? Come on. I was an athlete in high school. I dated a little bit in high school. And, and I, I like this one girl. And I gave her my high school senior ring. I did. And I said, I like you. I gave her my ring. And then I got saved. And after I got saved, I started to get different principles operating in my life. And I said, no, I don't think we need to continue to date. I'll take the ring back. And she said, no, you won't. And I said, you want to fight? <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> you want to wrestle? I didn't say that. You want to black? I didn't say that. She said, no, you won't. I said, well, I, I think I own it. She said, not once you gave it to me, you did. She said, what did you do? I went home and said, hey, Dad, what do you do with this? Here's what my dad said. The ring's not worth it. That was a lost dad. The ring's not worth it. If it's going to hurt a relationship that you've got with someone else, forget the ring. Mike, you're going to make plenty of money. You could buy 100 of those. Forget it. That's probably the only thing that she's wanting in life that's special to her. Let her have the ring. I said, but, and dad said, no. You asked my advice, I'm telling you what to do. If you didn't want my advice, you shouldn't have asked my advice. But if you ask my advice and I'm telling you what to do, then I, as your dad, expect you to obey what I'm telling you to do. He said, what are you going to do about that? I said, Dad, she can have the ring. <laughs> now, I don't know what she did with it. I don't know if she melted it for the gold. I have no idea. You know, I, I, I have no idea. I, I don't know if she went out and she crumbled it as she ran across it with her car thinking that Mike Wells. Vroom, vroom, vroom. I have no idea. I am saying this. I am saying that whatever comes down your road, you don't need to let it get under your skin. And you be that giver and not a taker. There are two things that you had better keep handy when people wrong you. You ready? Two things. You better keep handy when people wrong you. A short memory and a big cemetery. A short memory and a big cemetery. Hey, I'm 55, been preaching for over 30 years. I could name all the times I've been wronged, but I can't tell you anything about them. Because to be honest with you, I forgot. Well, I can tell you a roundabout way some things, but that's about it. There was a lady by the name of Clara Barton. She was the founder and president of the U.S. Red Cross. They said about uh, Clara Barton, she never held a grudge. One day somebody stopped Clara out and she was about visiting and they stopped her and they said, hey, they say you never hold a grudge, but don't you remember what so-and-so did years ago? Clara Barton said this, no, I distinctively remember forgetting that. Do you get it? Yes, I distinctively remember forgetting that. See, Joseph was an individual that understand. He's not saying that they didn't sin. He knows what they did. He's not saying they did not do anything wrong with him. He remembered what they did. But he chose not to take the platform of revenge. He chose to take the platform of pardon. And in your Christian walk, as you deal with other people, 
from different backgrounds, other people in different areas. Instead of using their sin as a place for punishment, why don't you use it as a platform to give pardon? I'll give you one last thought. The gloom was turned into glory. And amazing, I, I didn't get saved till I was 18. Now, now wait a minute. I, I, I enjoy it when these little kids get saved. I like it. Kid four or five, six years of age, they come up, I need, and they receive Jesus, and they understand it. Hey, that's great. Mom and daddy's probably had the Bible in the home a lot, and read it and read it and read it and prayed with them. And so, boy, they get saved. I'm so excited about that. I didn't have that. I didn't have that. I didn't get saved until I was in my late teen years. Late teen years. I didn't get saved until I was almost an adult. Now, because of that, stay with me now, because of that, I know from whence I came. I know the trail I was walking down. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I wasn't raised in Sunday school that taught the Bible. We, we learned Bible stories. We did not learn anything about Bible truth, but we learned Bible stories. So I, I didn't know anything about the Bible. That's why I went to Bible college. That's why I tell young people, you ought to go to Bible college for at least one year. Give God first shot at your heart. Then you can live the rest of your life with a pure conscience saying, God, I gave you first dibs. I mean, you had first shot at me, you know, and, and it's not saying he can't call you later. He might call you later. I've met men that was called. I went to Bible college with a guy. He entered into Bible college at age 62. He came to Bible college age 62. He surrendered to preach at age 60, and he fought it for two years after that not to go get trained, you know, and he was, a, he was a chemical engineer, and he said, but finally I had to lay it down. I was under such conviction, and he came to Bible college at age 62. He, he was able to cram four years into three. He studied. He did well. He got high grades. When he graduated from Bible college, he's 65. He goes out the pastor. He pastored the same church until he was 72 and he died. And he said it was the, the, the greatest years of my life. Amen. See, so it's never too late to surrender. It's never too late to put God first. But here you see that the gloom turned into glory. Watch this. Genesis chapter 45 and verse 9. The Bible says, uh, he says, haste ye and, and go up to my father and say unto him, thus saith thy son Joseph. God hath made me Lord over all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. Man, he is going to take care of people around him, including his dad. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? All of a sudden, their father, Jacob, getting that message. Can you imagine? Him thinking that his own boy has been dead all these years. I mean, all, 23 years now, he thinks that boy's been dead. And all of a sudden... They bring back the message. Now, you know they had to tell them the story. But I guarantee you that dad responded the way that son responded. Stay with me now. Here's what I've seen in families. All of a sudden, in a family, here's, here's, a, here's a dad or here's a mom. Stay with me now. Here's a brother. Here's a sister. And we take up other people's offenses. And we carry them. Well, my dad got offended by him, and I don't like him either. Well, first off, you don't like him apparently because mom and dad is talking about him. Yes. Well, let's go home and talk bad about so-and-so. And that's the reason that there's disharmony. That's the reason that some people have difficulties getting along. Look, don't take on somebody else's offense. My kids would come home and my kids would say, they would say, Daddy, so-and-so, they hurt my feelings. And here's what I'd say, get over it. Yep. If you got a problem with them, you go to them. Yep. Work it out. Work it out. Work it out. But until then, man, just get over it. Life is too short to spend your days crucifying somebody every single day because they disagree with you. Amen. And we understand that we are not the important one. He's the important one. We understand that. Well, so-and-so hurt my feelings. Well, get your feelings out of the way. Put Christ first. Put Christ first. 
There's a song that uh, somebody put uh, to uh, a verse. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. You know, you can't offend a dead person. Try it sometime. You can't offend a dead person. Go down to the morgue and say, hey, can I go in there and pick on one of your dead people? <laughs> First off, they're going to think you're crazy. Yeah, right. Second off, they ain't going to let you in. Yeah. But if you were to get in, and you went over there and you got up to the, close to that corpse, and you said, I'm mad at you. I'm mad at you. <laughs> and you pinch them as hard as you can. They're not moving. They're not moving. Had a dear lady. They're visiting here from the neighborhood. And she said, you're preaching. She said, it kind of got on my nerves. I said, really? She said, "Mm mm-hmm. She said, but it got good. She said, after it got good, I just wanted to see if you were real. She said, you know what I wanted to do? Just to see if you were real? I said, what'd you want to do? She said, this. And she reached back here, and she pinched me. (laughs) And I said, oh, that happened right out here. Brother Bell didn't protect me. (laughs) Grabbed it right there and pinched me. And I said, oh. She said, it hurt, didn't it? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, that's what you did to me the first time you spoke. (laughs) She said, but then it got good, and she let go. She said, it got so good, I'm coming back next Sunday. I said, you're not going to get around me, are you? I mean, you're not going to pinch me again, are you? And she said, no, I got over it. That's a normal reaction. It's a normal, you ever see guys? Come here, Sean. You ever see guys do this? They would hit each other real hard. And then the other guy would hit real hard. And then this guy would hit real hard. And then he'd hit real, and they keep doing it to see who can hit the hardest, right? Or you ever do this? We're in high school, we did this. Here we go. You know, he puts this up, and then I, as hard as I could. Then I say, okay, your turn, and as hard as he could. Then he put this up, and as hard as he could. You know, we go, and see who would chicken out. What are you guys nodding your head? You do that? John, what are you doing like this? Yeah, man, that's me, man. That's me, I got it. Come on. But isn't that the way we act? Come on. And we're supposed to be grown, mature adults. Somebody pushes you. (laughs) Isn't that the way we act? Come on. Hey, thank you. And you use that Facebook thing. Look, I love you, and I'm your preacher, and I'm telling you, I love you. Oh, sir. But you go on that Facebook thing, and somebody says, I think you're an idiot. And you say, I ain't taking that from nobody, <laughs> especially when I can't see them. Yeah, help now. Then you go back, I think that you're a bigger idiot, and your mother's ugly. <laughs> You know, then they come back. I don't care what you think about my mother. My daddy can beat your daddy. Yeah, yeah help him. Then it goes back and forth. Yeah, only if my daddy would let him, but my grandmother could beat your daddy. <laughs> Chicago boy likes this. <laughs> and, and you just go back and forth, back and forth, back, yeah. and there's no good in it. Amen. I mean, there's absolutely zero good in it. Yeah. 
Come on. Before you start crucifying somebody, why don't you uh, take the Frankensteins, okay? Why don't you instead, just say this. Say, man, I appreciate that couple. They're always sitting in church right in front of where the preacher preaches. Every time I look over at them, they're smiling. I mean, they got it down. You, you know what I'm saying? Why don't you talk good? Talk good. Talk good. Why don't you care about people? Come on. Here's what I'm saying. Joseph had every opportunity to slap. Every opportunity to say, hey, look, I'm over the place now. You guys, you did me wrong. Your day's here now. You're paying. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. Some of your wives wait till your husbands come home. You say, I can't wait till he comes home. And you've strategized this thing all day long. I'm going to wait till he comes in. He gets in at 720. By 735, he'll be sitting in a chair. After he sits in that chair at 735, I'm walking up at 737 and a quarter. And I'm going to stand before him and say, I've had a hard day. You probably don't know what I've gone through. And I've done this for you all these years, and I'm sick of it. And the guy was over there just. <sighs> not knowing what he walked into. Or you've seen the guys come home from work. Come on. You can tell when they're mad. You know? <laughs> Moving on. And the guy walks in. And you can tell just the way he walks in. You can, you can come on, you can read your husband's, Right? When he walks in, it's real casual. Hi, honey, how you doing? How was your day? <laughs> or when he comes in, all right, I'm home. What's for supper? I've been waiting all day for a good meal. This better be one. That's why most Texas homes have dog houses in the backyard. I'm saying, you have to work on those relationships. Right. Ben felt so bad. We were on, we went up to uh, National Sword, last, last illustrate, went up to uh, National Sword of the Lord Conference. God was so good to us. Molly, which is brother uh, Bobby's daughter, allowed our boys to stay down in uh, her old house down there. And so they stayed. And uh, Marlon Smith, which... Uh, Marlon, I've known him. We kind of grew up together as Dr. Smith's son. He's the executive vice president of Sword of the Lord. He called me up and he said, hey, Brother Wells, I just happened to have a hotel room. A pastor from uh, Scottsdale, Georgia got sick. He's not going to be able to use the hotel. It's a five-star Hilton, all the bells and whistles. Uh, it's uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a, a double tree. He said, it's got everything that you'd ever want. He said, if you want it, it's yours. won't cost you a penny. He said, I just, I, I thank you for being you. And he went on and he said, I just, I want you to have it. I said, hey, thank you so much. I'll take it. I'll take one of the boys with me. And, and so I took Ben, Ben Baldivis. And so uh, it, he was the only one that was going to go with me. And it just kind of expanded. And the other guys wanted to go and stuff. And, and it worked out good. And so, but since he was the first one, I said, okay, I'll take him. So he went over to the hotel. And we went over the second night. And, uh, and uh, to, no, third night, went over the third night, and all the lights were out. And I looked at Ben, I said, probably this is not good. <laughs> the hotel's on that whole side of the street, all the lights were out. So uh, we went in, and they said, well, the electricity, uh, something happened, and all the electricity's out, and you can't stay here tonight. If you want to, we'll let you. We can't kick you out because it's paid for. We don't suggest you stay here. And I told Ben, I am not going to stay in a hotel room with you when there's no air condition and smell you all night long. I am not going to do that. I said, so let's do this. 
we'll, because there was, there were seven beds that was over uh, at, at Molly's house. And so I said, let's do this. Let's just grab her gear. We'll go over and join the guys. It was already uh, 1230 at night. And I said, so let's drive the van up, because you had to go around. The doors were locked down. The elevators didn't work. Had to drive around to the top of the hill and then get out there, then walk up the steps, get your luggage, and bring it down. I said, so let's do that, Ben. We'll drive around. We'll get out. Well, the, the van was parked on an incline as he pulled it in. And so the, the driver's side, and he was my driver for the week, and so the driver's side was on that incline so that, you know, the door would automatically shut. So I got out, and I started to walk in, and, uh, and the, the, you know, the ignition key was still in there, and Ben jumped out, and when he jumped out, he could not jump back fast enough, and the door slammed shut. And he came to me, and he said, Preacher, you're going to kill me. I said, why am I going to kill you? He said, well, the van is still running. I said, so? Go, go turn it off. He said, I can't. The key's in the van. I said, well, yeah, that's probably why it's still running. He said, no, you don't understand. The key is in the van and the door's locked. He said, I can't get in. I said, Ben, why'd you do that? And he said, oh, preacher, I know you're, I, I said, I'm not mad. We'll make the best of it. it, it it'll be okay. We'll, there's something fun that's going to happen out of this somewhere. <laughs> I just can't figure out what it is right now. So, you know, I figured if I've got to be up trying to find a record, I'm going to call Brother Palmore. And I, I, so I called Brother Palmore and I said, look, do we have insurance on this thing where, where somebody, he gave me a number, and sent me the card, I guess, took a picture of it. And I called them. Office hours is from 8 o'clock to 4.30 p.m., Monday through Friday. If you have an emergency, please contact us at a later time. And it did not leave a number. It was already a later time. It was 1230 at night. And so anyway, so, so uh, we called a record service, you know, and thank God for Siri. And so I called a record service with her help. And, and a record came and is one of Bo Brother Bobby Robertson's members or whatever. And he was able to get it over. And so 2 o'clock at night, we're getting to Molly's house to bed down. Now, I could look at that and say, man, I tell you what, I lost beauty sleep. But can I tell you, I've been trying to get that beauty sleep for years that hadn't helped anyway, so it didn't matter. <laughs> Second off, you, know, you can get mad at something, and all it is is a waste of energy. Man, we laughed. We carried on. We're, we're falling down the steps. Our luggage is falling down in front of us. We're tumbling over the luggage down the steps. I mean, you know, and, and just having a good time with it. Now, can I tell you, don't take things so personal. Don't take it personal. I tell these guys that work for me, look, uh, I, I, I'm your boss. Don't take it personal. When I have to get on to you for a ministry that you need to correct in an area, don't take it personal. I've got to run it like a business. Now, after I get on to you, hey, we'll go eat, and I'll be your best friend forever, Amen. especially if you buy. <laughs> but don't take it personal. All right, now I'm saying the very same thing inside the church. Somebody gets on your nerves. Don't take it personal. Somebody bothers you. Hey, forgive them. Somebody does you wrong. Here's what you do. Feed them the rest of the days of their life. That's what Joseph did. Take care of them. Give them blessing. Your mom, your dad, they disappoint you. They hurt you. Love them all the more. Love them all. By the way, it will build a relationship. It sure will. Father, bless, we do pray. Thank